Mark, thank you for joining me today. I'm so happy that you're here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, so I, as I told you before we started, I loved reading your book. It's not, I won't say it's like a beach read, but I read it on the beach. <laughs> and, nice. And, but I, I really couldn't put it down because, you know, this topic to me is, um, I have a child, my own child, that, but I've always been really interested in what it, you know, what goes into fostering, what it, go, what goes into surrogacy. And, you know, there are people that um, go down different paths for different reasons. And, you know, you hear there's a lot of movies or stories about really terrible um, things that have happened in situations with foster. And, um, mm -hmm. and so I, I was very interested to read your book from a, from a person who has been through situations and come out the other end and knows a lot about it. So I want to jump right into it. I want to know from your perspective, and I know a lot of these questions I'm going to ask, I know the answers to because I read the book, but <laughs> I just want to, um, for our listeners who haven't read it yet, yeah. and everyone should, it's called Safe. Um, but I I wanted to know why you chose to foster um, instead of um, getting a surrogate or anything like that. Yeah. You know, my my husband and I were newlyweds and we were trying to figure out how we wanted to start our family. And mm -hmm. so I had had three cousins who entered our family through foster care. And so I knew something about it. Now, granted, I was seven when the first one arrived. So, I mean, you really don't get a full knowledge of something at seven in that yeah. sense. But, um, you know, I was aware of it and I had done some work with a nonprofit in the foster care space. So I thought maybe at some point I would foster. But we started going out, we're looking around and, and we met with a bunch of different surrogacy agencies and we were pretty much like you made our decision. We were gonna we we're gonna do surrogacy. That was it. And then we went down and we had breakfast with a friend of ours who happened to age out of the foster care system. And she's sort of this uh, really awesome kid who just was schooling life. I mean, she was working on her master's, I think. Now, at the, maybe at the time, or she was an undergrad at the time. I don't remember. But during the conversation, she said to us, "You know, I um, I was raised by women who you know by, who weren't my mother." And, you know, so I was raised really without my mother. And we thought, you know, our kid obviously will be raised without their mother as well, regardless of how we do that. Mm -hmm. She said, and while these women were amazing to me, I always felt like I came second because they always had biological children of their own first. Mm -hmm. And we thought, oh, well, you know, it was like as soon as we left the breakfast, we got in the car and Jason, my husband, turned to me and said, you know, maybe we should do foster first and then surrogacy afterwards. Um and I was like, you know, I, I agree with you. I think that's the right way to do it. And then, of course, when they came to our house, they said, you have a big house. Would you consider siblings? And then before you know it, you've got too many kids. <laughs> so, right. Yeah. You know. So can you explain um, the the premise of fostering, though? Do people go into it thinking, oh, I'm only going to have this child for a short amount of time? Are they like, what are what's the yeah. mindset going into it? So I, I think... The way that it's supposed to be presented to people, honestly, is that it is a temporary thing. The mm -hmm. idea is that a family is going through arguably the most difficult time of their life and mm -hmm. their child, you know, is removed from them for whatever reason. And the, the goal at first is to keep them within their family or within their community, you know, a, a, an aunt, an uncle, a grandparent, a, a, a teacher, a friend. Uh, and if they can't find that, then it's a stranger. And that's really where foster care comes in in that sense. And you know, in California, where I live, 55% of kids that enter foster care reunify. They go back to their birth parents. Uh, the okay. goal is to to help all kids go back to their birth parents, but that doesn't always happen. And in right. that event, um, usually after there's no family that's available or so on, then a foster parent becomes sort of first in line uh, if they're interested in adopting. Mm -hmm. And that was sort of the process that we took, but we kind of went in thinking, with that wrong mindset of like, oh, we'll just get there and we'll get this baby that, you know, has been left at the hospital or something and we're going to be able to just take them home. And, you know, that was what we expected and not exactly what happened. <laughs> right. So are, what are the stats? I mean, maybe you don't know them off the top of your head, but of children that are coming from foster that have been abused in some way, have gone through some sort of trauma as opposed to um, kids who may not have been around the trauma, but their parents um, can't be you know, there for them at the moment, like a young child or maybe a child who wasn't exposed to anything abusive. Yeah, I would say, you know, I, I don't want to rattle off stats on top of my head because I will be lying to you if I do that. But, mm -hmm. you know, the, the most common reason a child enters foster care is neglect. Um, and and what that is sort of, an, it's really an umbrella term that mm -hmm. captures a lot of things. It's ne neglect maybe because of 
mental health issues for the parents or substance abuse issues for the parents. Um, it's more often it's like those sort of things that are, that are going on where the child is then neglected. You know, abuse is obviously plays a part in it as well. Um, right. You know, and even, uh, you know, uh, uh, horrifically, um, even though I think agencies do their best to do background checks and weed out everything on anyone that's coming into foster, kids in foster care have reported, you know, a significant number of abuse by their caregivers while they're in care too, which is, right. you know, a horrifying stat. Yeah, but and you hear do, stories I, like that all the time, actually. Yeah. And they do, I, mean, I will say that agencies do their best to do background checks and screen. And I mean, the, you know, the process you go through to become is, is intensive. It's not um, light. And, and that's by design. You know? Yeah. Well, actually, let's get into that. What is the process of becoming a foster parent? So it does vary wherever you live in the country. But where I am in California, it involves about, I think it was around 30 plus hours of in-class training, or they could do it now on Zooms and oftentimes, uh, mm-hmm. where you're learning things about trauma, abuse, neglect, like things like what what to expect when you're expecting a kid in foster care, mm-hmm. you know, and a lot of that covers things like ACEs, you know, like the adverse childhood experiences. So, um, you know, all of us experience different losses, like going to school for the first time or having a babysitter and your parents leaving the house for the first time. But kids in foster care experience things like maybe there's community violence or violence in the home or the death of a loved one or something that is is unique to their personal experience. And those things. And then, of course, just the mere fact of being taken away from your biological parent. Yeah, that separation in and of itself. Yeah. yeah, it's entirely traumatic. And so, you know, we learn about that and then they do a home inspection where they come over and they check out your house and they make sure you have, um, you know, your prescription drugs are locked up or your um, it's safe for the child to be there. It's clean. Um, you know, your canned goods aren't four years old, <laughs> whatever it is, right. um, you know, and they, they, you're going to be there's some general standards like you have to be able to support yourself um, so that you're not relying on the support that comes in from that because they you do get paid a, a tax free stipend while you're fostering, uh, but that's just to help supplement the cost of the child, not you. Um, right. So this things like there's some requirements. Were there any? Um, I don't want to say red flags, warnings that they would give you um, before you started that you should look out for, or you know things that that you might that might want to deter you from actually doing this. Oh, I think there are a lot of things that might deter people from doing it truthfully. I, I mean, you know, I wrote this book because I wanted I wanted to lift up these kids that are in the situation and their families, right? Mm-hmm. But ultimately, you know, people that I talk to now are like, I don't know if you talked me into it or out of it. And I was mm-hmm. like, well, that's kind of my point is I really wanted to um, be as transparent as possible so that if somebody were to come into this process, they're not shocked when something happens. You know, they understand... You know, a, a, for example, a, a child who's eight years old that has been abused or witnessed abuse or witnessed violence in their home or in their community and all these different things, their emotional age is going to be a lot younger than their physical age. And mm-hmm. so when they react to things, it's going to be different than the way that a typical eight year old reacts. And you have to sort of be prepared for that and also have the grace and, you know, for them where you're like, hey, you know, it's OK. This is. I get it. Like, I know why you're doing that and be there and support them and, and um, have the patience and understanding. You right. know, I think that's stuff is some people are like, I don't know if I could do that, you know? Yeah. Okay. Wait, I have a question because I've always been, um, I've never understood how it works. You hear a lot, not always, but a lot about um, how children move from foster care to foster care to foster care. Mm-hmm. I don't necessarily know that I've heard that people have been in foster for a huge amount of time. Now, wh- why would someone move from one to the other? Is it because the fosters said, oh, I only want to do this one year at a time? I mean, obviously there are issues sometimes, behavioral issues or yeah. whatever. But can a foster parent be like, I don't want to do this anymore and get rid of them and ask for a new one? They can. I mean, it's not, you know, it's, I think the goal is to try to make sure that that doesn't happen because you're yeah. obviously just reinforcing more trauma onto a kid with another move. It's another school. It's another set of friends. It's another, you know, yeah. set, set of caregivers and so on. So the goal is to not do that. Right. Um, there, but oftentimes, you know, kids will move and it's, it can be a host of reasons, you know, things like um, maybe the foster parents took a job out of state and had to move, or maybe the, um, you know, there's the, the, 
biological parents are moved, you know, moved across the state or something like that. And they wanted them to be closer so they could, you know, continue to work on reunification where they're moving, you know, where they're going to visit. Uh, and you can visit if you're several hours away or those sort of things. So it's just, um, there's a host of reasons, but sometimes just kids have different behavioral challenges too. That's usually, you know, 99% yeah, of the time. Which is the result not of shocking. Trauma. Yeah. Right. Because of where they're coming from. 